My name is Laura, and I'm a clergywoman serving a local church in Potomac, Maryland. I've had the privilege of serving seven congregations over the course of my 39 years in ordained ministry. And each week, well, most weeks, I find myself diving deep into the scriptures assigned by the Common Lectionary. It matters not that I have preached most of these passages multiple times. Each sermon is written for the week at hand, and inevitably, there are things left over. Thoughts that I have, ideas that I've gleaned from a variety of voices, usually left on the cutting room floor. And then Matthew joined our staff at Potomac United Methodist Church and challenged me to create a podcast with my leftovers. So here we go. I'm not too old to try a new thing, and I'm hoping that in the few minutes we will share, you might find something loosened in your chest so that hope and grace may fill you to overflowing. That's my simple prayer. Welcome to Leftovers. When I arrived at my office this morning, one of my newer parishioners was leaving our office suites. She followed me back to my office and directed my attention to a beautiful vase of flowers, exquisite actually, a color of peach in roses and hydrangeas mixed with white and green. I smiled at the kindness, a bit teary if I'm honest, as I expressed my gratitude. She said the card explains, so I read the card. Pastor Laura, each Sunday as I leave service, your infectious smile is always there. At the end of the service this past Sunday, I noticed a somber face. So please let these flowers put the smile back on your face. Blessings to you. I'm so glad I smiled. Truth is, I'm feeling a little worse for wear this week. Can't quite put my finger on all the reasons, but I know it feels like grief. Because I know what grief feels like. I know the darkness that creeps along the outer edge of reasoned thought that pulls us down. The sadness that invites us to sink into something that feels an awful lot like despair. I think it's because of what's happening in the Holy Land, the cries of the innocent in Israel and Gaza, the mounting death toll, the fear. I have no solution other than to cry out, stop it, stop it right now. Only no one is listening, and so I'm grieving, grieving over death. Yesterday, I had a funeral. That's the way we say it in the world of clergy. I had a funeral. The woman who died was 84 years old. I didn't know her. I do not know the family. One son and her husband of 57 years came into the church office last week, dazed, the woman's mom is buried in our cemetery, and they asked if they could put her body near her mom's. Now, the real answer is no. I'm sorry, but we only sell plots to members of the church. But they seemed so still that the words choked me, so I said yes. And yesterday, I stood with the family on one of the hardest days of their lives, trying to bring a feeling of peace, as if it's going to be all right into their grief. Did I hit the right notes? I never know for sure, but I try. I try to feel them so that I can stand with them. And every time I do, some old piece of grief gets plucked in my soul. In my family, when life overwhelms us, we say this too shall pass. And it does eventually pass. The hard edge of grief gives way to a dull ache. Ultimately, the dull ache gives way to memory, and laughter is always on the heels of remembering. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was on to something when she named the stages of grief back in 1969. It took me a while to appreciate the brilliance of her work. I'm an ordained woman who has stood in more hospital rooms and at hospice bedsides than I can remember. I've buried more people than I currently know. I am the one who pours the salve of hope 
and heaven into the chaos of death. Kubler-Ross named the stages of grief as these, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. As a young pastor, I imagined that a person would chug their way right through, but I no longer live on the island of naivete. Grieving is not a straight line, damn it. Lord, how I wish it were. But it's not, it's just not. On top of that, I need to say that death is not the only experience that takes us down the mourning path. It's a job not gotten, a promotion denied, a dream unrealized, a relationship lost. You can fill in the gap. And it feels like every experience of death draws out every other we've worked our way through. And we're forced back into the grief work we thought we'd completed. But as it turns out, we just got busy enough to ignore. Grief does not choose to be ignored. Me, personally, I tend to hang out somewhere between anger and depression. In the early days of grieving, I swing back and forth as if I'm captured on some cosmic seesaw. Kubler-Ross wrote, Guilt is perhaps the most painful companion of death. I second that emotion. So many questions choke us when death comes. I was with my dad when he died. My head laid on his chest, tears falling. I felt his final breath and heard his heart when it stopped beating. I was not alone. He was in hospice care in my living room. My mom, his best friend, my daughter, his caregiver, my husband, we were all there. We cleaned him, covered him in a quilt I had just finished making. We made the calls that needed, making, including to the funeral home. It was first thing in the morning, and I asked the guys at the funeral home to delay arriving as long as they could. Clergy make friends with all kinds of odd people in odd places, but I can assure you that the best people on the planet own family funeral homes. Throughout the day, our family arrived. I never left his side. I stayed close to the body that had held the life force of my dad. I held that hand that had held mine. I rubbed the quilt over his arm as if I could continue to bring comfort there. We built a fire in the family room, closing the door off to the living room. A neighborhood deli delivered food and family gathered, all of us gathered, until it was early evening and the guys from the funeral home showed up. I left my dad then and my brother stood witness as they folded his arms and encased him with the black bag and removed him from the house. It was an amazing day. Everyone said so. I think we sat Shiva for my dad or as close as a Christian family can to honor the dead. My nightmares began two days later. Halfway through the night, I was startled awake with the terrible belief that maybe my dad was not dead. I couldn't breathe. What if I was wrong? I thought, what if no one else checked to be sure he was really gone what if they thought I knew what I was doing? What if? Three nights later, the dreams had not subsided. Dad was in a nursing home, and he was afraid and confused and waiting for me to find him. I was a mess. Finally, I called my friend, the funeral director. I'm sure I sounded insane, but he listened without interrupting. And then he said, Laura, your dad is dead. I took care of him myself. Your dad was no longer in that body. I've heard you talk about the glory of heaven and the promises of Jesus so many times. So let me tell you, your dad is in heaven with my dad. Trust me. So I left the room of denial, but not without noticing that there were many other people still in that space. You see, no one can tell you how to grieve how long it will take, how many months you will spend in one frame of mind before you're able to shift into another. The stages of grief will not be ignored, nor will they behave like a number line, allowing us to move from one 
to another until we graduate to acceptance. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a pioneer. She came to the United States in the 1960s and was flummoxed by the way the terminally ill and their families were treated. No one talked to them. Everybody talked about them. Their diagnoses were guarded like secrets that they were rarely told. So she took on the medical establishment and changed the way we care for the sick and dying. She brought the conversation about life's ending into the open. Her first book on death and dying was published in 1969. She went on to engage in groundbreaking research through conversations with patients who had what she coined near-death experiences and offered us a view into what it might be like when we die. She wrote, the ultimate lesson all of us have to learn is unconditional love, which includes not only others, but ourselves as well. Her final book, The Wheel of Life, was published in 1997. It was such a profound read that I have supported its publishing with the purchase of a dozen copies that I have given away. Her later life was not an easy one. Two strokes left her partially paralyzed, wheelchair bound, with care 24-7. In her own dying, she questioned everything that she had ever believed and the lessons she had offered the world to pastors like me. It broke my heart to read. She wondered out loud if she had made any difference to the world at all. So I can tell you, she made a difference to me. From her, I have learned that everyone experiences grief in their own unique way, but we all have to make the crawl if we hope to be whole again, if we hope for acceptance acceptance that life moving forward will be different, accepting that our lives are not over and that the universe demands at some point that we get out of our bed and start breathing again. Our mail carrier here at the church asked just this morning, Pastor, do you think our friends and families in heaven are cheering us on? And I say yes. I can hear a heavenly chorus barely perceptively hollering, get up, life needs you, come on, you can do it. So weep, my friends, for as long as you need to weep. Draw breath from the ocean, sit on a rock and holler at creation, dare yourself to hike a mountain trail or swim in a lake. It's too cold for this time of year. Do something to remember you are still alive, even when the bombs are exploding all over the Holy Land, claiming lives. Find your light and shine it. It's the only way I've found to make it through grief. Have a great day, my friends. I'm holding you in prayer. Amen.